uh, in 1979, there's a, Viet- a man named Tom Garvey, a Vietnam veteran. And Tom Garvey, had, when he had come home from the war, he uh, was trying to get back up on his feet. He was looking for jobs. He was looking for a place to stay. He was, he was looking to kind of get his life back on track. And he was struggling, going from job to job and, and place to place. And at one point, his uncle landed a catering contract at the now demolished Vet Stadium in Philadelphia, home of the Eagles and the Phillies. And so Tom's uncle starts working there and contracting with them to, to, to cater and to bring in food. And, 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 and Tom's uncle found an opportunity for Tom, which was to work in the parking lots. He said, hey, nephew, come and, and you can get this job. It's a stable job. You're going to be working outside. Come and, and at least it'll, it'll give you something to do. So, so Tom started working in the parking lots, uh, bringing in cars and, and ushering them out as they leave for events. And as time went on, Tom kind of rose through the ranks of the crew and he became a manager. And with being a manager came a, not only responsibility, but some authority. He got keys to the stadium. One time in the city, they were having a huge event, and the city asked the stadium, hey, can we have people park in your parking lot? And they're like, okay, sure. Tom found out the day before, so he scrambles to get a crew together to help park cars early the next morning, but they had to get there super early, and he was sure that all of his buddies were just going to sleep right through their alarm, so he had an idea. Hey, guys, come. I know this little place in the stadium we can sleep over. So bring a sleeping bag. We're going to camp out in this old concession stand at the stadium. And so they did. The next morning, they got up. They parked all the cars. It was a huge success. But Tom had an idea. Tom had an idea that, man, I, he said, I bet I can live here. I bet I could live in this concession stand and nobody would ever know. And guess what? He did. For three years, he lived in this old concession stand. Everybody saw him. Everybody knew who he was. They saw him early in the morning, late at night, but nobody put it together that he was actually living there. I mean, just imagine 60,000 people coming and going out of this stadium on a daily or weekly basis, and nobody knew it. It was hidden in plain sight. He got AstroTurf for his floor. He brought in some furniture. He even had a toaster oven, a a coffee maker. I mean, what else could you ask for, right? This is what he said. He said, it was right in front of their eyes. They just couldn't believe it. Their disbelief is the key to how I got away with it. Here's the thing. Just like thousands of people failed to notice Tom so can we fail to notice God in the hustle and bustle of our days, can't we? I mean, for so many of us, this is what our life feels like, that it's just coming and going, and there's just one task after another, and, and we have so many things going on that, that it's right in front of us, yet we can simply fail to recognize it, that we can simply fail to, to connect with God. But what if it didn't have to be that way? What if you and I could connect with God in a real intimate way, socially, uh, relationally, spiritually, intellectually, emotionally? What if we could connect in an intimate way with God no matter what's going on, no matter what it is that we're doing in life? No matter what it is that's coming our way, no matter if we have a a whole million things to do that week or, or we're able to just take a vacation, what if we could connect with God in that way? Because, you know, most of us don't live there. Most of us don't live that way because we, we get really good at sort of compartmentalizing our lives, don't we? That we have our time with God and that's maybe on a Sunday morning or with our community group or our quiet time in the mornings or, or whatever that might be. But then everything else, we have, we have the whole rest of our life and, the, and, and those fall into other different compartments. But what if, what if it didn't have to be that way? What if we could connect with God no matter what it is that we're doing and no matter where it is that we're going? And so that's why we're doing this series called Shifting Gears. And this series is based on, we're using this tool from giant leadership training that our staff has been going through recently. And they have this tool called the Five Gears. And you've seen this, if you've been here, you've seen this image right here. And really quickly, to just kind of recap these, this is, this is basically, you, you see these gears in terms of how do I work and how do I relate with people? 
This is a great tool for you practically. If you're just looking for ways to kind of balance your life, use this tool. So gear one is, is the recharge mode, that we all need rest. We all need time off from work. Gear two is the connect mode. This is where we, I need to have lunch with my wife in order to, to sit and stop and just connect, to have deep conversation, to hear about what's going on in life. Gear three is the social mode. This is the, the, the cocktail hour. This is chit chat. This is, this is just catching up. This is inside jokes. This is just sort of, you know, having friends. And then we have gear four, which is the task mode. We're going to come right back to that. And then gear five is the focus mode. This is where you set aside everything else and you put all of your time and energy into whatever it is that you're doing. And, and the goal with these gears is that as leaders, as workers, as family members, that we strive to intentionally be in each of the gears every single day. So gear four, let's look at this gear four, because this is where we're going to be living today. This is the task mode, all right? This is your to-do list. I mean, most of us have a to-do list. Maybe it's on our phone. Maybe you're old school and you like to write it down. How many of you have a to-do list? Okay, and it's already filling up for this week. How many of you, if you're like me, even if I've completed an item that's not on my list, I'll still write it on the list just to check it off? Okay, good. It makes me feel better. Like I'm getting stuff done. You see, this is what gear four is. This is where we live most of the time, isn't it? This is where we try to multitask. This is where we wake up in the morning and we're answering emails and we're on the phone on the way to work. This is where we have to go to work. We have to stop by the grocery store on the way home. We have to pick up our kids from school. We have to take them to, to baseball practice. We have to get to our small group. We have to do this. We have to do that. We have to do that is what gear four is. It's, it's one of the most important gears. It's one of the gears that we're in most of the time. However, at the same time, it's one of the gears that we experience God the least. You see, as we've been looking at this tool, the five gears, we thought, what if we could understand our connection with God through the lens of these five gears? And it's clear because week one, we had this idea of rest, that we can rest in God, that he invites us to Sabbath, not only weekly, but daily. Gear two, that we are invited to pray with him, to, to talk with him, to have deep, heartfelt conversation with him. Gear three, we're invited by God to be his friend which is an amazing, <clears throat> mind-blowing truth. But gear four is a tricky one because it's full of the busyness, it's full of the mundane, it's full of the menial tasks, isn't it? And so many of us, we, we may not consciously make this decision, but in the back of our minds, we're going, how in the world, how in the world am I supposed to connect with God while I'm doing the dishes? What does that even mean? How in the world am I supposed to connect with God when I'm sitting in I-25 traffic? How in the world am I supposed to connect with God when I have a million things to check off my to-do list? I simply don't have time for that. So what does it look like? What does it look like that we can connect with God in gear four, in task mode? Here's one of the tricky things about gear four, is that it's an easy place to get stuck in. It's an easy place to get stuck in. In fact, if, if your day looks like waking up in the morning and before you get out of bed, you're checking your email, there's a good chance you're stuck in gear four, right? You're, you, you check your email before you get out of bed and then as you're getting ready for, for work, you're <clears throat> maybe listening to a podcast or on your way to work, you're on a phone call and then you get to work and you have a million things to do and then you know the, the, the thing goes on and on and on. Most people who get stuck in gear four switch from gear four to gear one. Why? Because we start working in gear four at six o'clock in the morning. By the time we get home at nine o'clock at night, we crash into gear one. This isn't a healthy way to live our lives, is it? It's also not a, a, a healthy way to connect with God. So what does it look like for us to connect with God in gear four? We're going to be looking at one main verse today, and it's in the book of Colossians. This is what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Colossae in chapter 3, verse 17. He says these words, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, God the Father through him. Let me ask you this. What does it mean to do something in the name of the Lord? This is a phrase that, that you might say when you finish a prayer, right? In the name of Jesus, I pray. 
Amen. Or maybe when you think of that phrase, in the name of, you, I don't know, for me, for some reason I went, my mind went to movies and I think of the cop who's chasing down the, the criminal and she says, stop in the name of the law. I don't know if they really do that, but in the movies they do. Or maybe you think of the Supreme song, right? Stop in the name of, okay, I'm not going to sing it. M- Mandy, can you sing that for us? What, what does it mean? to do something in the name of something else. Well, it's real simple. It means three things, okay? In the name of means for the sake of, by the authority of, and on behalf of. For the sake of, by the authority of, and on behalf of. You know, like most families, every now and then we run out of something really important like double stuffed Oreos. And we live about a half a mile away from a a grocery store. And so every now and then uh, we'll ask our kids, hey, hop on your bikes. Here's 20 bucks. I want you to go buy some Oreos, okay? And, uh, and, And don't buy anything else. Just buy some Oreos. Come on back. Now, when I do that, my kids are going in the name of dad. Do you see that? They're going for my sake, right? Because I need Oreos. They're going uh, in my authority because I've given them the money to make the purchase. And they're going on my behalf. They're going in my place. I don't have to go. Here's the thing is I'm the beneficiary. Well, so are they, if I'm honest. I'm the beneficiary of them doing something in the name of dad. But they're not going on their own power. They're not pulling out their own 20 bucks to go. They're not coming up with the idea to go do, the, do, do, do this themselves. No, they're doing it on, in the name of dad. And here what Paul says is, look, when it comes to gear four, do it for the sake of, do it in the authority of, and do it on behalf of Jesus. Now, if we're honest, we don't like this. We don't like this because you and I, we do things in the name of a lot of other things. Without even realizing it, we do things in the name of a lot of other things. I mean, think about how many things we do in the name of success. Think about how many things we do in the name of comfort, in the name of profit or progress, in the name of retirement, in the name of a bank account, in the name of reputation. Think about how many things we do in the name of people-pleasing, I mean, think about that. In fact, that might be a good question for you to stop and think about is what really is going on in my heart? What are my heart motivations? Who am I doing this for? What am I doing this for? When I go about the craziness of my day, what in the world am I doing this for? And when we hear verses like this, when Paul says, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, we kind of rationalize it. And we think, okay, well, that's why I go to church. That's why I go to church, Jesus, to kind of check that off the box. That's why I go to my small group to check that off the box. That's why I give. That's why I serve. That's why I, you know, do whatever it is. I I, I help at the youth group. That's why I do those things because they're in the name of Jesus. But everything else, you know, that's, that's a different story. Like hands off. Hands off, Jesus. I mean, I do my stuff. I I do your stuff, but, but I do my stuff. I mean, maybe that's a question to sit with this week is, in the name of what are you living in gear for? That question alone can be a life-changing question for some of us. In Psalm chapter 24, we see these words, the earth is the Lord's and what? Everything in it. The world and all who live in it, all right? In case we missed it, he's saying the earth is the Lord's and everything, the whole world and everybody who lives in it. Here's the thing. Here's the key to understanding uh, doing things in the name of the Lord. It's understanding ownership. That's really what it comes down to. It's understanding ownership, that it's all his. Like your job that you worked so hard to get, that you interviewed for, that you climbed the ranks through, guess what? It's not yours. It's his. Your house that you pay mortgage on, it's not yours. Your bank account, it's not yours. Your cars, guess what? Your family, it's his. 
Your very life, the breath in your lung, in your lungs, the time that you're spending doing whatever it is that you're doing, guess what? It is not ours. It's his. And the more we begin to understand that all of it is his, that, that, that he owns it all, that he has authority of, over it all, that if he's the owner, we are the stewards. And the more we get to realize this, in fact, the longer we live, the more we understand this fact, right? Because you see things that you thought were in your grasp just slip away. Your health, maybe a loved one dies unexpectedly, your bank account just sort of explodes. And we quickly realize like, oh, maybe I'm not as in control as I thought I was. Maybe none of this stuff actually is mine. Maybe it's his. You see, doing things in the name of Jesus is realizing that Jesus is king. He's king. He's not just our friend. He's not just our savior, but that he's, he's king that he oversees all of it, whether we realize it or not. So Paul says, look, do it all in the name of the Lord. And he goes out of his way to emphasize three times. He says, whatever you do, in word or deed, and then he says, for those of you who are in the back that may, maybe not have caught it yet, everything, do everything in the name of the Lord. Let me ask you a question. How much of your last week, how much of your gear for was spiritual work? Think about that. How much of your gear for time in this last seven days was spiritual work? We're going to come back to that question here in just a moment. Here's the thing that makes gear for so hard. is be, because we, uh, we're busy and, and, and be, we believe that the rest of life, that the menial tasks the to-do list that we have to do, the things that we have to do over and over again, the, 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 the list that we have to get checked off isn't spiritual work. I mean, think about it. Folding laundry, picking up the dog poop, mowing the lawn, paying bills, planning meals, all the things, going to work, answering emails. I mean, how in the world is that spiritual work. But here's the thing, it's wrong thinking that seeped into our minds because we love this line that we, this imaginary line that we draw between sacred and secular. That over here we have the sacred stuff, which is going to church and, and hanging out in the lobby and being a part of our small group and, and having our quiet time and serving in the youth ministry. But then over here we, we have everything else. We have everything else. But here's the thing, that doesn't exist. That, that, that distinction does not exist. It's not, it's not true. Jesus himself was a carpenter. I mean, think about that. What if we understood everything that we did as spiritual work? And here's the thing, Paul, in this chapter, he's addressing servants who by very nature, their job description was just to do whatever their masters were telling them to do around the house, around their estate. What if we understood everything we did as spiritual work. Charles Spurgeon, a 19th century preacher, says this, to a man who lives unto God, nothing is secular, everything is sacred. He puts on his workday garment and it is a vestment to him. He sits down to his meal and it's a sacrament. He goes forth to his labor and therein exercises the office of the priesthood. His breath is incense and his life a sacrifice. He sleeps on the bosom of God and lives and moves in the divine presence to draw a hard and fast line and say, this is sacred and this is secular is to my mind diametrically opposed to the teaching of Christ and the spirit of the gospel. So again, how much of your gear for time was spiritual work this last week? All of it. All of it was. Whatever you do, I don't care what it is, if it's done in the name of Jesus, it's holy ground. Now, I got to say one word because some people have read this verse, Colossians 3.17, and they've used it to justify their workaholism. That I go, 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 that I'm doing it all for God, that I'm, that I'm, that I'm, that I'm neglecting my health, 
I'm neglecting my family. I'm not resting. I'm not doing anything else. I'm go, 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 because it's all for Jesus. And here's the thing. This verse does not justify doing that. It does not justify workaholism. In fact, for some of us, gear four is doing gear four in the name of Jesus means that we need to make some significant changes to what gear four looks like. Maybe that's you. Maybe this week gear four needs to look a little bit differently. But here's the thing also is that it's not just for the sake of, it's not just in the authority of, and it's not just on behalf of, but we get to live in gear four with God. Psalm 139, David says, where can I go from your spirit? Like, where can I run from your presence? I can't go anywhere without you being there. And here's the thing, friends, we can't do anything in gear four without God also being there, which is just an amazing truth. I mean, how much differently would you live your life if Jesus was literally riding shotgun with you? I mean, it would be, it would be night and day, wouldn't it? That when we're answering emails, Jesus is sitting right there next to you. That when we're on a phone call, that he's sitting right here next to you. That when we're at work, when we're at soccer practice, when I'm sitting in traffic, whatever it might be, that Jesus is sitting right there next to you. And he's saying, hey, I'm inviting you into something. You want to change your life? Do all of this menial busyness in my name. And not only that, but I get to do it with you. Would you do that with me? Now, if there's maybe some small pushback, maybe something in your heart is kind of cringing and you're like, yeah, but like, why does he have to be in charge of everything? Like, why can't I just have this over here that I, why can't I just do my own thing? I mean, let me ask you this, what better way to live in gear four than doing it with him? What better way to live in gear four than doing it in his name? I mean, do you really want to keep living in gear four in the name of your ego, or in the name of success, or in the name of people pleasing, or in the name of building your bank account, or whatever it might be, do you want to keep living your life in gear four that way? Because if so, my warning to you is that you're just going to continue to be on that exhausting treadmill stuck between gears one and four. Here's the thing, you can do the same task in the name of different things and have very different experiences. What would it look like for you to do gear four in the name of Jesus? As we get ready to wrap this up, Paul gives us a second thing, a second way for us to connect with God in gear four while we're doing everything in the name of Jesus. He says this in verse 17. He says, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Living lives of gratitude. You see, connecting with God in gear four means that we're living lives of gratitude. First Thessalonians, another letter written by the same author to a different place. First Thessalonians 5 says this. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in some circumstances. Most. Most. Give thanks in the good circumstances. Give thanks in the... In the, in the great, no, obviously, give thanks in all circumstances. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We give thanks in all things. I mean, the Bible says that every good gift is from God. Think about all the good things you have in your life. Every single one of them is given to you by the king of the universe. Every task you have, the job that you have, all the things going on in gear four, guess what? They are gifts from God. The fact that we were able to wake up this morning, the fact that we're able to see color, the, to, taste few, to, to taste food, to, to feel love, to see beauty, all of those things are gifts from God that we get to experience and connect with God in gear four when we are grateful. Are you grateful? Even in the hard things, and I don't mean just trying to find the cheap silver lining. I mean in the hard things, when, when you're faced with a health trial, when your health is out of control and you're scared, what does it look like to give thanks to God in the middle of that? What about when your finances explode? What does it look like to give thanks to God in the middle of that? What, is, what, is, what about when, when that loved one dies? 
when life takes a sharp turn, when, when you're faced with regret, when whatever it is that is going on in your life, what does it look like to stop and, and to give thanks? You see, it takes a posture of humility to do that, doesn't it? What about giving thanks that he'll never leave you? No matter what it is you do, no matter where it is you've been, no matter what's going on in your life, that he will never leave you, that there's nothing in all of heaven and all of earth that will separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Give thanks for that. There's something that he says here that most of the time when we hear it, we just kind of glance over it. But he says, give thanks to God the Father through Jesus. Did you catch that? You see, this in and of itself is something to be thankful for. That through Jesus that we can be thankful. We can be thankful that we can be thankful. That we can approach God, that we can come to him boldly and thank him for all of his good gifts. Why? Not because of our own merit, not because of our own badges of honor, not because of what we have, have done that's good, but simply because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that through his death, burial, and resurrection that he places on you and he places on me his righteousness, his holiness that we get to boldly come before the throne of the king of the universe and be grateful that we are adopted as sons and daughters of the Most High King. Are you thankful today? You want to experience God in gear four? Do it in the name of Jesus. Do it on his behalf. Do it for his sake and do it in his authority. And you want to experience God in gear four? Be grateful. Be grateful. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for today. God, we are so grateful for your goodness to us. God, this gear is so tricky. It's so easy, especially in our culture, to just get so bogged down with to-do lists. God, to think that I'm the master of my own domain, that I'm the owner of all of my time and, and everything. Father, would you fix our thinking? God, would you steer us back to the truth, God, that everything is yours. God, that everything we get to experience is, is yours. That we're just simply stewards. And so God, in that vein, would you help us to live in gear four as if we're doing it for you. God, in your name. Father, for those who are here that maybe haven't made that step, God, maybe they can sense your spirit inviting them. They, God, they feel you inviting them and drawing them in. Father, we thank you for sending your son to die a criminal's death in our place. God, so that we can be called righteous, that we can be called sons and daughters of God, that we can boldly come in front of your throne and thank you. And God, for those who are ready to make that choice today, Lord, we thank you that it's just simply a matter of believing in our hearts and speaking with our mouths that you are God. Lord, we trust you and we thank you. And it's in your good name we pray. Amen.